Hello, this is Richard Thornton from the People of One Fire. It's a quite a complex story about Fort Carolyn and, and the concealment of the Appalachian culture in North Georgia. It begins really in 2007. I was retained by the American Museum of Natural History in New York to prepare architectural drawings for the Mission Santa Catalina de Guali on St. Catherine's Island, immediately north of the mouth of the Altamaha River near Darien, Georgia. As a first step, they sent me a box of Spanish archives that I had to read before I drew the first line on my computer. I immediately started seeing some strange things. I was just beginning to learn history, very frankly, uh, at least the colonial history. I was reading eyewitness accounts from friars about, it appears that Fort Carolyn, or the runs of Fort Carolyn were very close to their mission. There are a couple of counts of the friars paddling their boats over in the morning to visit a village next to the ruins of the old French fort. And in one particularly interesting account, a ship was wrecked off the coast of St. Simon's Island. The natives paddled them first to the mission, and then a little bit later, the friar and a group of natives agreed to carry them back to St. Augustine. But on the trip back, first they paddled into near the ruins of Fort Carroll and showed it to him and it was only two or three hours paddling time. Then several days to get down to St. Augustine. Uh, it's impossible that Fort Carolyn could have been near her Jacksonville today if the ruins that the friar showed them were a morning's paddle from St. Catherine's Island. Then we got into the, the turmoil of 2012 with the uh, Mays and Georgia controversy. And first we were puzzled why Florida anthropology professors and students would be so actively involved in opposing what we're doing. Surely had no, nothing to do with them. And they even set up a website for a while to oppose the concept. It, it seemed totally out of, of appropriateness to the situation. And then we began to realize something. Now, if the Apalachee who, and the Ishati, who are their closest associated with them, built stone structures up in North Georgia, and the French book said that the Apalachee and their stone cities were at the headwaters of the May River, then it'd be impossible for Fort Carolyn to be in Jacksonville because one could not exist without the other. The Appalachian culture was at the headwaters of the, of the May River. Fort Carolyn was at the mouth of the May River. So removing either one of those false beliefs from the past by the uh, professors would cause their entire academic world to come collapsing. You'd look at generations of books and professional papers that were based on Fort Carolyn as the benchmark to determining where everything else was in the southeast one or the other and everything comes down. Let's look at the record though. As late as 1625, Spanish map makers didn't even know the St. John's River flowed into the Atlantic Ocean. At that time, it looked just like marsh. There was no visible river outlet. We go to the early 1700s. I'll quote James Adair from his book. The Creek Indians informed me that when they went to war against the Floridians, they carried their cypress canoes from the head of the St. John's Black River, only about a half mile, when they launched them again into the Deep River, which led down to the multitude of islands northwest of Cape Florida. That means that even the 1700s, the broad mouth of the St. John's River, which then would have been about a half mile deep and probably several miles wide, was too shallow to allow passage of a loaded creek war or freight canoe. Astounding. That's pretty shallow water. In 1776, earthen ruins of a fortification about 11 and a half miles up the Altamaha River were visited by William Bartram and were described in his famous book as ancient ruins of French and a Spanish fort. He was staying with a host at Broughton Island, which is about a mile closer to the ocean than this site. 
when they took him by boat to visit the ruins of the fort. Nearby, in 1934, Smithsonian Institute archaeologist James Ford excavated test holes in this archaeological zone and found numerous 16th century artifacts, including weapons, tools, broken dinnerware, and other detritus. He was rather young at that time and certainly didn't know about the early history of Georgia, so he assumed what he found was an unknown Spanish camp or fort, even though he was puzzled by the presence of French artifacts mixed in with the Spanish. Everybody forgot about that because James went on to other things and I didn't really find about this until I saw a, an old movie published by the National Park Service from the 1930s which mentioned that fact. We go to the American Revolution. I think one of my ancestors actually was in this boat, by the way, but I, I'm pretty sure he was. Could we have got the valleys into the St. John's River? I would, with the men I have with me, made the whole province of East Florida tumble. In other words, they would have captured East Florida and never gone back into foreign hands. That statement was made in a book by Colonel Samuel Elbert in 1780, Georgia Continental Rangers. The state of Georgia built three flat-bottom gunboats especially designed for making lightning raids on British camps and ships then escaping over the tidal marshes at low tide. The British corvettes and other larger ships could not follow them into the shallow water. Georgia had all the British forces in East Florida trapped on the St. Johns River north side near present-day Jacksonville, but their Delta Force boats could not make it through the mouth of the St. John's River, even at high tide. We're talking about boats that were able to go over grass at low tide with just a skimming of water, and yet they couldn't get into the St. John's. Okay, we'll go to the villain who, who changed everything. I'm sure people in Florida don't consider him a villain, but from the viewpoint of his history, he was. George Rainsford Fairbanks was born in 1820 in Watertown, New York. After graduating from Union College in New York, he married and then moved to Florida in 1839 to become the clerk of the Federal Superior Court in East Central Florida. It was located in St. Augustine. He immediately began buying up large tracts of land near St. Augustine and along the St. Johns River near Jacksonville. At the time he moved to Florida, the mouth of the St. Johns River was not accessible by large seagoing traffic, but had been dredged enough to allow flat bottom paddle wheel steamboats to pass through a high tide in a very narrow channel. However, the sand was also constantly shifting, so even the smallest boats were often trapped when trying to enter the river. As a result, the economy of Jacksonville languished. Its port was primarily used by small barges, which were paddled up and down the interior of the North Florida. Why well, gonna bust your bottle, bubble here? Um, there's no evidence that Juan Ponce de Leon ever visited the site of St. Augustine or was looking for the Fountain of Youth. This is one of the myths created by Mr. Fairbanks. Fairbanks published his first book in 1858. It was entitled The History of the Antiquities of the City of St. Augustine. It introduced the myth that Ponce de Leon was searching for the Fountain of Youth. As a result, he sold a lot of real estate around St. Augustine and gave a reason for 20th century tourists to come visit the town. In 1868, he published The Spaniards in Florida, comprising the notable settlement of the Huguenots in 1564 and the history and antiquities of St. Augustine. This book stated the May River was the original name of the St. John's River and Fort Carolyn was located somewhere on the St. John's River. Fairbanks sold a lot of real estate around Jacksonville because of that book. But here's something astonishing. Neither book by Fairbanks contains any references. There's nothing to back up anything he says about the history of Florida. It gets worse though, folks. Then in 1881, Fairbanks wrote the official Florida history textbook for Florida schools, which he used his first two books as references. Do you understand what I'm saying? He had no references, nothing to back up his speculations or myths about Ponce de Leon and about Fort Carolyn. Then he writes a much more dignified and detailed book to use as a textbook for many generations in Florida, and he uses the unreferenced books as his source. 
It was the only history that generations of Florida students have ever told. College professors today reference this book as their proof that Fort Carolyn was near Jacksonville. Okay, let's go straight here. St. John's River's mouth was impassable to seagoing vessels until 1851, 1858, excuse me. Uh, the accounts of Fort Carolyn describe seagoing vessels being able to sail up to near the fort. That's how they built the thing. Now some larger ships, the galleons of the Spanish, could not get that close, but even the smaller ships would not have been able to get through the St. John's River. The St. John's River could not possibly be the May River and Fort Carolyn couldn't possibly have been in the state of Florida because the May River flows from the mountains southeastward to the sea. Here's a, on your left is a topographic map prepared by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers prior to dredging the St. John's River. You can see here uh, at the mouth it's a series of small inlets, islands, sandbanks uh, that are as shallow as two feet at high tide. At high tide, as I said, though, the problem was the sands were often shifting, so what was a channel today might not be one tomorrow. During the 1920s, economic leaders in Jacksonville watched auto-based tourism in St. Augustine explode and looked for a way to lure those cars off U.S. Route 1A into Jacksonville. They settled the idea of promoting Jacksonville's French heritage based on the two years that they had believed Fort Carolyn was located there. However, they had absolutely nothing French to show tourists. Over 15 years of searching by archaeologists could not find any evidence of Fort Carolyn or Fort San Mateo. No pottery, no, no guns, no evidence of post holes, no weapons, no swords, no nothing. So the city fathers selected a location on the river solely because it would be picturesque for tourists. What I'm telling you is the location of Fort Carolyn National Memorial was originally selected because members of the Chamber of Commerce thought it would be a great place for tourists to take pictures. That's all. The site happened to be near an old Civil War artillery dam, which is basically some piles of dirt stacked in front of where they had cannons. It was not a real fort. Nevertheless, the city erected a sign saying this was the site of Fort Carolyn. To this day, Florida historians vainly try to find evidence here of Fort Carolyn. There's even been some small books written and published in Florida in which historians or amateur historians vainly try to find proof that Fort Carolyn was at a location that was originally selected merely because it was a nice taste of like to take a picture. In 1940, the city of Jacksonville gave land to the U.S. Navy for building a naval base with the provision that it would be named Mayport, thus making people think that the U.S. Navy also thought the former name of that location was the May River. Now, people in Washington wouldn't know the difference. They come down to Florida and the local historical society, the mayor, the Chamber of Commerce, you name it, tells them, oh, this used to be the May River. And so the guy uh, says he's an admiral from from Washington, D.C., who grew up in Chicago. Well, okay, this is the May River. Okay, we'll call it the Mayport. A concrete imitation of marble monuments erected by the French to claim North America was erected at the mouth of St. John's River. There, they also erected a sign stating that the original modern monument was located here. There's absolutely nothing arche archaeological to make that statement. And, and make it as a fact at least. Uh, in 1950, the city of Jacksonville gave a small trek around the sign near the old Confederate fort for a bogus location of Fort Carolyn to the federal government. A bill was placed in Congress by Representative Charles E. Bennett naming it Fort Carolyn National Monument. If Bennett's name sounds familiar, he also wrote the book Three Voyages in 1999, which supposedly justifies all of this. The bill was passed as Fort Carolyn National Memorial because other congressmen got wise to the fact there was absolutely nothing there for people to look at except a sign. I want to tell you something about Bennett's book. 
Uh, in the front it says it's uh, the first accurate verbatim translation of the original French memoir by Captain René de Laudonnière. In examining the book, I realized it actually is not the translation of the French. Whoever wrote the book, it probably wasn't Bennett, merely took a this Bethian translation from 1785 by Richard Hakluyt and changed it to modern English. Bennett's book has the same translation mistakes as Hakluyt's book does. They, they mistranslated some medieval French terms, nautical terms. Just to be sure, I ran those passages past a professor in another part of the United States who was a specialist in medieval and early Renaissance French, and he confirmed that it was a mistranslation. They got the meaning opposite. They didn't understand the colloquial word for south and north back in the 1500s. In 1962, the Kennedy administration authorized funds to build a tiny replica of Fort Carolyn. As I said earlier, it's about one twelfth the size of the real thing, one twelfth or one eighteenth on one side. Uh, the public is not told that this is a tiny, mini replica of the real fort and it's not even a good scale model. You'd be surprised the number of Floridians I've talked to who are totally shocked when I tell them that the fort they went to many times was not the real fort. And we're talking about people who live in Jacksonville who grown up in Jacksonville, they're not even aware that the fort is a fake. Something where, where children are in their teens when the fort was built. That hand-painted wood sign to note Fort Carolyn at, at a site chosen because it would be a nice place to take photographs has grown into a 72 square mile National Park Service facility named the Timucuan National Ecological and Historic Preserve. Amazing. This is what Fort Callan really looked like. As I said, uh, it was intended to be large enough to hold a thousand people and already had buildings up to support maybe 500 people. There were 360 living at the time of its capture. But as you see, the scale is very different. The layout's quite different. The long side is 1,800 feet and had many buildings in it. That's the dilemma. I'll repeat again what we started at the beginning. If the name of the Appalachian Mountain is derived from an Appalachian people who lived at the headwaters of the May River, as described by the French, and Fort Carolyn was built at the mouth of the May River, if one or the other of the current myths, namely that Fort Carolyn is on the St. John's River and that the Appalachian Kingdom never exists, if either one of those changes, then everything falls apart. We're talking about many generations of academic papers, of books, the, the prestige of anthropology professors, then that true origin would totally discredit millions upon millions of federal dollars which have been invested in the National Park Service's 46,000 acre facility around the Bogus Fort Caroline. Plus, the Cherokee Indians can possibly be indigenous to Southern Appalachian Mountains because for many centuries, the Appalachians lived there. And so now you know.